Welcome to Bloom Baptist Church Services. We're glad you're joining us. Whether it's for the first time, you missed us on Sunday, or you're returning to an old favorite. If you'd like to join us for a live Sunday morning service, you can find us at the address on the screen. Our Sunday morning services are at 1045 a.m., and you can get plugged into a LifeQuest group at 930 a.m. Want to find out more about what Bloom Baptist is about? Check out our new members class and information on our LifeQuest groups at our website, bloombaptist.org. Stay connected with us through our website, bloombaptist.org, or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you'd like to give to Bloom Baptist Church today, just head to bloombaptist.org org slash giving and follow the instructions on the webpage. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that through the service you are about to watch, that Christ is magnified and that the Word encourages you, challenges you, and transforms you. Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be continuing our series in the book of Job today. We're going to be in chapters 32 to, thir- to 40. 32 to 40, just the first part of 40, really. Uh, But before we get there, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit today about uh, your giving, your your tithes and offerings. And when we give our tithes and offerings, it's easy to imagine that it's used to pay the bills of the church, that it's used to pay the gas bill, the electric bill, the whatever. And certainly that's part of it. But because you give, we were, over this past summer, we were able to send our children to kids camp, our youth to... Uh, super summer for them to have their home base camp uh, here at the church and part of the results for that was seen in the month of August when we baptized 13 people and that's awesome and uh, so I probably in in my 17 years at Bloom Baptist that's been one of the best months maybe the best month that we've ever had and so I just want to tell you that that is a really good reason to give and I want to thank you uh, for giving. In fact, this week, another really cool story. I, one of our uh, ladies here at the church who has been at our church for a long, long time. She's been here. This is my, I'm in my 18th year. She was here when I uh, came as pastor and she has been praying for her husband for more than 50 years. And this week he came, uh, became a believer in Jesus Christ. So we're thankful for that. And I just wanted to say thank you for your giving. If uh, you're, if you want to give and you're currently not giving, you can, uh, you can find the link on our webpage, bloombaptist.org, and you can give online or you can mail that to the address there as well. But just, just wanted to start out today saying thank you uh, for your giving. Again, today we're continuing our series in the book of Job, difficult book, difficult things to comprehend in the book of Job. Uh, Job is one of the books that we could have spent many, many weeks studying. Um, in fact, one of the, the podcasts that I listened to is a, um, a fellow who, te- who, who is a Bible teacher, and he has, uh, he has taught through the book of Job. And each of his, I think there's probably 12 or 15 uh, individual podcasts, and each one lasts more than an hour. And so we could have done that, but for our purposes, we wanted to move a little more quickly. So we're kind of doing an overview of the book of Job. But I think there's still some good value in looking at that. Today, we will see the fourth of Job's uninvited counselors. His name is uh, Elihu, and, uh, or Elihu, however you say it. Um, and we're going to look a little bit at his words, but then we're also going to look at God's response to Job in verses 38 through just the first few verses of chapter 40. Some believe Elihu's speeches were added later, uh, and the reason for that is there was no rebuttal uh, by Job to the things that Eli- uh, Elihu says. Um, also, God uh, doesn't mention him in his rebuke of Job's friends. When you get to chapter 42, and we'll look at that next week, uh, he mentions the other three, but he doesn't mention Elihu. So uh, a lot of people believe that um, he this this might have been added later. He, he, and his advice was pretty much the same as the other three. Uh, the other reason is the placement of his speeches. It seems out of place because last week we saw in verses uh, 29 to 31, that Job is making his case to the Lord. And then in verse um, 38, we're going to look at this today, the Lord answers Job. And then right between that, there's the six verses, or excuse me, six chapters, where uh, Elihu speaks, Elihu speaks, and, and it just seems out of place there. 
Um, and so that's some of the reasons people have for believing it may have been added later. I think it was original to the book myself. I think the, the placement, among other things, it introduces the things that God is about to say to Job. And probably the biggest reason I think it's original is there's no evidence that it was added later. There, there's no... There's speculation, but there's no evidence uh, to that. And so I just think it was original uh, to the book. Let's talk a little bit about what we know about this guy named uh, Elihu. First of all, we know that he was younger than the other three men that came to counsel and speak to Job. In chapter 32, verse 6, it tells us that he was younger. That's the reason that he waited to speak, because he was respecting those who were older than him while they spoke. And perhaps he was much younger, because if you look there, at least in some translations, he refers to um, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar as advanced in years. So it may have been that he was much younger than they were. But, but we know that he was a younger man. Secondly, we know he's an angry man. If you look at uh, chapter 32, verse uh, 2 and 3, as well as verse 5, it tells us that he, he basically says himself that he was angry. He was angry at Job. He was angry at his three friends. Maybe he was just an angry young man. Also, I would suggest that Elihu was an arrogant man, that he talked a lot about himself. Um, and probably thought a lot about himself. It seems that he thought himself more uh, to be wiser than perhaps he really was. If you look at chapters 32 and 33, you'll see that he used the word I a lot. Uh, in 36, chapter 36, verse 4, he claims that this knowledge, this wisdom that he had is from afar, probably meaning that it is from heaven or that it was uh, divine knowledge that he was given but he speaks about himself uh and as he speaks about himself it seems that he thought himself better than others especially as he spoke to job it seems that he was speaking to job as if job i'm better than you but we need to remember that in chapter one that god himself referred to job as blameless and upright and then the fourth thing that we know about elihu is that he was long-winded you go to chapter 32 verse 18 he said i am full of words and his speeches in the book of job are the longest uninterrupted speeches in all of the book he talked more than any of the other three friends at least at one time he spoke more than job he spoke more uh, than god here in the book so he was he was long-winded um in we need to understand that he did make some good points. In fact, one commentary says that he was almost right. And so today we're going to look briefly at the words, the, the counsel of Elihu, and then we're going to quickly go over and to see God's answers to Job. So today we want to begin then with what Elihu got right, the, the greatness and the majesty of God. In, in Job 36, verses 1 to 12, this is what we read. Elihu continues speaking, let me go on and I will show you the truth. For I have not spent, I have not finished defending God. I will present profound arguments for the righteousness of my creator. I am telling you nothing but the truth. For I am a man of great knowledge. God is almighty. But he does not despise anyone. He is mighty in both power and understanding. He does not let the wicked live. But gives justice to the afflicted. He never takes his eyes off the innocent. But he sets them on thrones with kings. And exalts them Forever. If they are bound in chains and caught up in a web of trouble, he shows them the reason. He shows them their sin of pride. He gets their attention and commands that they turn from evil. If they listen and obey God, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. All their years will be pleasant. But if they refuse to listen to him, they will cross over the river of death, dying from lack of understanding. So here, uh, 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 Elihu presents God as both uh, mighty and merciful, especially in verse 5. While God knows uh, everything about us, including our sin, he says that he convicts us of that sin. And he offers us an opportunity uh, to repent and be forgiven. And, and I think all of that 
obviously is true. But Elihu also connects repentance with the restoration of uh, prosperity. It's the idea that God prospers those who are right, but he punishes those who aren't. That if we do what is right, that we're going to be blessed and we're going to be uh, financially, we're going to be rich, we're going to have all of those things. And what Elihu is doing, he's looking at Job and saying, Job, if you'll just repent of these deep sins that obviously are in your life, then God is going to return to you your fortune and your family and all of these things. Uh, So he connects those things. But then if you get to verse 14, he mistakenly uh, says that if you do not repent, those who do not repent will die in their youth. They will die young. And um, certainly we understand that that's not true. It's not it's not just uh, evil people, bad people uh, that uh, sin and and may die as a result of their sin one of job's complaints to god's was that evil men seem to prosper and um do well while me being blameless and upright i'm going through all of this suffering and we have to understand in our life that sometimes even when we do everything that we know god wants us to do that there may be suffering The psalmist wrote, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. We need to understand that in this life, there will be trouble. I was sharing the gospel with a man one time, and he he said to me, Mike, if you can tell me why God allows uh, good people to struggle, and he seems to bless uh, people who are worse than me, then I'll be saved. And I remember the answer I gave him. I don't know why God does that, but I wouldn't let it be the reason I go to hell. And I think that's important for us to understand that in this life we will have trouble. Elihu is right in saying that God is mighty and that he is merciful, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But I think he is mistaken in saying that God immediately and and, uh, eternally punishes those who do wrong while he blesses those who do right. That that might be an American way of thinking, that because we do, you know, at least in our mind, we're, we're good and God will bless us. Well, the remainder of chapter 36 and 37, Elihu speaks of the majesty of God. He calls God exalted in power. He is uh, eternal in nature, and that is beyond our comprehension, that he governs and he directs all of nature, that he is the creator of all things. And all of those things are absolutely true of God. But Elihu concludes in chapter 37, verse 33, that the Almighty is beyond our reach. Um, And some today think of God as being up there and we're down here and he doesn't really interact with uh, people uh, today. They think God is, is a mighty God, but he is an absent God. While we will see him someday that we can't see him today, And I think Job, and I know even myself, I would give you the testimony that God is a God who is interested in being connected in the everyday activities of our life. That the things that concern us concern him. That we, because of Jesus, can have a personal relationship with the Lord. Well, the second point that I want you to see today is that God speaks, but he doesn't answer. Uh, You notice that God doesn't even recognize Elihu he moves from we move from chapter 37 where Elihu is speaking to verse uh, to chapter 38 and God is responding but he's responding to Job so he he moves straight to to uh, Job's declaration of his innocence that we covered two weeks ago um, uh, and he doesn't really acknowledge that Elihu is even speaking. Look at verse 38, chapter 38, verses 1, 2, and 3. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Maybe he was talking about Elihu. But he goes on to say, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. So rather than answering Job's questions, about his suffering, God gives Job what I would call the ultimate science quiz. When I was in junior high, one of our teachers used to do the 
the atomic fireball quiz is what he called it and he would ask oral questions and you'd raise your hand if you knew the answer and if he chose you and you got the answer he would throw you one of those atomic fireballs that the candies that were really really hot and I and when I when I thought about this today I thought man this is what kind of what God was doing uh, to Job. And so as we look at this, at, at God's science quiz of Job, he begins by talking about the question of origin, the study of origin. We call it cosmology. And in verses 4 to 7, God asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimension and stretched out uh, the surveying line what supports its foundation who laid its cornerstones as morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy so God is asking Job if you're so smart if you need to know so much where were you when it all began later in verses 12 to 21 God asked have you ever given orders to the morning to start the day it's the idea that like Man, I'd, I'd like to sleep in a little longer today. So we're going to start morning at 8 and let the sun come up at 8 instead of 6. And God said, Job, you couldn't do that even if you tried. But God does that every single day. Have you ever given orders to the morning to start the day? Have you called the lightness out of the darkness? Do you know how big the earth is? And the obvious answer to this question for Job was no. So God moves on and he goes into the area of oceanography. He says in verse uh, 8 to 11, he said, who kept the sea uh, within its boundaries as it burst forth from the womb? Who is... Uh, uh, and, and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, for I locked behind uh, barred gates, limiting its shores, I said, this far and no further will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. And so God challenges Job to look at the ocean. We love to go to the beach. It's, a, it's a, obviously a big vacation spot. We like to go to the beach. And as we look at it and see the vastness of the ocean, God is saying to Job, look how big the ocean is. Look how mighty the ocean is. Look how unpredictable the ocean is. And he says to Job, where were you at when I created that? Where were you when I said, this is the boundaries of the ocean. Job, have you ever said to the waves, this is how far you can go, and then you must stop? Again, the obvious answer, Job, no. I, you know, Job doesn't say it. We know what he's thinking. He moves on to the weather, meteorology. Um, and we make fun of the weatherman today because he's only right probably less than half the time. But when God... Uh, speaks and weather happens, he's right all the time. And so he asked Job, Job, have you ever seen the place where I store snow and, and, and hail? Have you seen those places? Do you know where it's at? Have you ever sent lightning on its way or directed a storm in its path or determined how strong and where the wind would blow? Job moves, uh, excuse me, God moves on then to uh, uh, astronomy. He says to Job, uh, it talks to Job about the movement of the stars and um, what binds constellations together. And he starts asking questions about uh, Orion and uh, Pleiades. And he's, Job's probably going like, I didn't even know they had a name. How can I know what holds them together? How can I do that? Look at verse 33. He says, do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? What God is saying to Job is not only do I control and regulate what happens on earth, the weather, its beginnings, the ocean, and all of these things, but he said, I control even what happens in the heavens. We were reminded that Genesis 1 verse 1 says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and that he still controls all of those things. In chapter 39, God spends a great deal of time talking to Job about zoology, about the animals. And he questions Job about animal life. And he asks him about lions and um, ravens and goats and wild donkeys and ostrich and oxen and horses and hawks and all of these things. Now, I would suggest to you that if you go back and read Job 1, Job had a lot of livestock. And some of the answers 
to the questions that God was asking Job about animals, Job probably knew. He, he asked him, do you know about like when the goat, when it's time for the goat to give birth and all those things? And Job as a farmer had observed these things. He knew some of these things, but God is asking a much bigger question. And what Job came to realize at the end of that is that he could not possibly know all the answers to all of the questions that God was asking him about these animals. But I think the point that God is making is simply this, that when we cannot understand the situation, we need to trust the one who understands it all. Faith in adversity means that we trust God in the things that we do understand, but also we trust him in the things that we don't understand. And we trust him in the things that we may never understand. If he controls the heavens and the earth, if he controls the weather and the ocean and the animals, I think it's safe to say that he's got it under control. And maybe today you're facing a situation that's beyond your ability to understand. And you may be thinking, if I only knew why, things would be better. If I only had the answers, things would be better. And in the midst of Joe's adversity, he may have had the feeling, if I only knew the why, if I only knew why I lost all of my family, my children, why my wife seemed to turn on him. And if you go back to chapter one, you'll see why I say that. Why he lost his wealth and his servants and his place in the community. Joe may have been thinking, if I only knew the why, then it would be easier. And I think we all know that it wouldn't have been. And as far as we know, Job never got the answers to those questions. But here's what we do know, that he grew not only in his faith, but he grew in his relationship with the Lord. Trusting God beyond our problems means that we trust him in every situation. And it means that we know him. And in order to trust him, we have to begin by knowing him as our Savior and as our Lord. So I would end today with the question for you. Has there ever been a time in your life when you asked Jesus to forgive your sins and to be your Lord? We're thankful for reports and evidence in our church that lives are being changed by uh, by the Lord. I'm thankful for the baptisms that we ex we've experienced. But here's what I know in your life, nothing will ever change you until you allow God to be your Savior, the one who forgives you of your sins, and to be your Lord, the one who directs your life. And if you've never done that, we invite you to do that today. Maybe today you're facing adversity. It's a difficult season in your life. Maybe it's a problem that exceeds your understanding. And rather than look for the answers to the problem today, I encourage you to trust God. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks today for um, your power and your majesty. Uh, the fact that you control the heavens and the earth and we can't understand it. But Father, because of that, we know that we can trust you. And I pray that in our trials and our troubles today, that we would trust you and not just the answers to our problems. I pray for those that need to know you today, that today would be their day of salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to respond to the risen Christ today, need prayer, or just have questions, please send us an email at info at bloombaptist.org or call the number on the screen. Don't forget to stay connected with us via our website or Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you decided to give to Bloom Baptist today, just head to bloombaptist.org slash giving and follow the instructions on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.